Welcome everyone to our Easter service and happy Easter. Uh, it's a great delight to be here with you today. Um, it was lovely to be at St Brides in the grounds last night um, and we pray today for all those who are gathered in St Michael's and in St Dunstan's um, this morning or will be gathered in St Michael's this morning a bit later. Um, while we gather here online still um, continuing to worship in this way. I'm just going to light the Easter candle and if you have a candle at home you may want to light it now too. Come liberating Christ, rise to meet us. Hear our wounded cries in the travail of the earth. Banish the darkness of our fears. Release us from the tomb of powerlessness into empowered living in the light of your liberation. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, Alleluia. And the reason I've kept the screen share going through that bit is I've got a song now. There we are. Song now. Um... come to our time of confession and do respond, God have mercy. Holy God, we have squandered your gift of life, clinging to that which is passing, controlling that which should be free. God have mercy. Vulnerable God, we have turned from the cross. We have shunned suffering and sought our ease. God, have mercy. 
sharing God, we have denied relationship and closed down when we could have opened. God have mercy. God of mercy and love, forgive us all we have squandered, set aside and squashed. Set us free to live as your friends in the name of the one who lived on earth as the friend of all. Amen. God unlimited by mortal fear or tomb's cold grip. In the lingering dark, give us grace to know your life triumphant, your love undimmed, in the face of Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. Amen. So I'm joined this morning by Eve and Rose. Eve's going to give our readings for us and then Rose is going to lead our intercessions in a moment. So thanks Eve, we're gonna have the two readings now. Eve, you need to unmute yourself. Really sorry. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, beginning at verse 34. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. 
But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she went, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Uh, speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of the strangest things about John's version of the Easter story is how emptiness is at the heart of it. There's this emphasis again and again on the space that is left because Jesus isn't there. Um, first of all, Mary Magdalene finds that the stone's been removed, and you can imagine coming to a tomb at dark and it being pretty spooky. That's something out of a horror film, going to a graveyard when it's dark and seeing the, the stone there and this kind of black emptiness of the tomb. Um, so she runs away, of course. And uh, as in a horror film, the not knowing what's there is, is scarier than actually being able to see a, a dead body. Peter and the other disciple, we don't know who that is, but it, it's generally assumed it's John who's writing the gospel, run towards the tomb and they go in. Um, and again, what they see is an emptiness. And it's really emphasized by the linen wrappings. It, there's no body there, but there are the wrappings that would have been around the body. Again, you know, we're taken into horror film territory. The kind of wrappings of the mummy are left there on this stone slab. And then Simon Peter goes in and the space where the body was is emphasized even more. We're told that the wrappings were there and then separately the cloth that had been over Jesus's head. There's a real sense of the emptiness of the space where this body should have been, emphasized by the, the cloth that is no longer wrapping the body. And then it continues, you know, that they run off Mary stays there weeping, and when she looks in, she sees two angels. She's not interested in the angels. What she notices about the angels is simply that they're sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, another at the feet. Again, all she really, it's incredible, isn't it? Two angels <laughs> appear, and all she notices is their positioning in relation to the space where Jesus's body should have been. And as I was thinking about this, in the particular context of this year um, and the, the strange year that we've had and, and, you know, the strangeness even now of the fact that here we are, second year running, celebrating Easter at home. You know, today there are, there are some people back in our churches, um, but many of us not. Many of us still uh, feeling safer here. This idea of the space between us and the space of a human body seems particularly resonant. And I was re remembering back in the early days of, of COVID, um, 
remember there used to be all those banners around in in the early times when we weren't wearing masks and we were just trying to you know elbow bump and wash our hands a lot there were lots of banners people were having banners printed saying stay two meters apart and there became a bit of a thing um, of trying to visualize what two meters apart were and you could see them from all over the world you know um, in australia there were images of two people on the beach with a surfboard in between them saying stay one surfboard apart um, I saw a wonderful one uh, on, on Facebook from a very high anglo Catholic church, which had a little graphic, a little sort of stick man swinging a thurible. And it said, stay one thurible swing apart. <laughs> there was one in, in Sefton Park that had seven ducks in a line and told you to stay seven ducks apart. Um, and a particularly appropriate one for Liverpool, although it actually came from Japan, uh, was an image of the Abbey Road crossing with the beetles on it, uh, telling you to stay one set of beetles apart because the measurement from the front to the back on that level crossing was about two meters. Uh, reminiscent of um, the, the evergreen, the ever given ship getting stuck in the canal. I don't know if any of you saw, there was an app that was created where you could put the ever given anywhere you wanted in Google Maps so you could see you know, it was much bigger than Liverpool Cathedral. You can see how big it would be across the Mersey. Um, again, back about this time last year, uh, the CBBC website created an app where you could put Peter Crouch, who's two metres tall, lying down against different things to get a sense of what that space was. Two metres is about a human adult male lying down. And here at the heart of this story is this space, this space where a body should be and isn't. This sense of emptiness and distance. And it seems particularly um, fresh this year that it then goes on when Jesus does appear and he's speaking to Mary and she suddenly realizes who he is when, when he speaks her name. She obviously wants to hug him. And he says, don't, don't hold on to me. Don't cling on to me. Don't, don't touch me. Um, because I'm not yet ascended to the Father. One of the strangest elements of this story. Um, but I'm here, but you can't hug me. You mustn't touch me. Again, that space between emphasized. And I was thinking, when I was first becoming a Christian, um, I was at university and so I was surrounded by quite a lot of, of the kind of, you know, very keen Christian Union types and quite a lot of those old books. So at the time, these books were already old. So these were probably the books that were being written 30 or 40 years ago. There was a huge amount of emphasis on the empty tomb. Many of you will, will remember this, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, there were books and books and books being written. Um, I, remember, I remember student union debates, you know, was the tomb empty? It seemed really important. It was as if, if it was empty, it proved something about who Jesus was. Um, I, it's not something that I hear people particularly interested in nowadays, whether or not the tomb was empty. It seems a bit of a no brainer um, and not particularly interesting anyway. I mean, Kind of clearly was empty. Um, the question, if any, is, is what had happened to the body. But it was it was really important to people, the emptiness of the tomb. And we've stopped talking about that, partly because I think we've realized that trying to argue some kind of logical student union debate argument is not going to persuade anybody of faith. But actually there was something important in that. And it wasn't a kind of forensic proof of who Jesus was, but it was that emptiness lies at the heart of the gospel accounts. There is far more in John's gospel account of the resurrection of emptiness and of Jesus's absence than there is of Jesus's presence. And even in that, Part at the end, you know, that wonderful moment where Mary hears, hears her name spoken as we might hear our name spoken. And, you know, you can read this afterwards, read this to yourself. But 
substitute your own name instead of Mary. It, it, it's really powerful. Hear God speaking your name and recognize him. Even at that moment, the emphasis in what Jesus says to her is that he's leaving. He has not come back. This isn't a kind of reversal. Oh, it's fine. The crucifixion has happened, but don't worry. Jesus is back. Everything's going to be all right. It's not that. It's going beyond that to something new and different. And we rarely focus on how much of the ascension is in this passage. Jesus says, don't hold on to me because I've not yet ascended. But go to my brothers and tell them I am ascending. Not I'm back again. I'm going away again. Why is this emptiness, this absence at the heart of John's gospel? At this very point, at the heart of our faith, where we celebrate the resurrection. And it seems to me that it's because this is not a, a, a simple reversal of death and suffering. We all know that people still die. I mean, this year, my goodness, we really know it, don't we? We know that, you know, being a Christian doesn't mean that the people that we love and lose, if we just pray hard enough, will come back from the dead. That is not the message of the gospel. It's not a reversal of death and suffering. It's some sort of breaking through to the other side, a transformation, breaking through into, into a space, by sort of knocking down a, knocking down a dividing wall in an old house, back to that horror film maybe, and finding a completely new, unexpected space behind it. I find myself thinking of the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Um, both of the moment where you, know, you go into an old wardrobe and suddenly there's this unexpected space opened up into this incredible, magical, different world. But also of that um, amazing moment, and if you haven't read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, don't worry about the fact that it's a children's book, go and read it today. Um, Rose is nodding vigorously. Um, there's a moment where Aslan, the lion who, is the kind of incarnation embodiment of God in this particular magical world, um, is killed, he dies. A dreadful, sad scene, he's, he's, he's killed on this stone table. Um, and then the table cracks and he springs into new life um, and talks about a deep magic. And there's the same idea of going through something, in, in, in fully embracing death and suffering. And you know, there are themes of, of justice and betrayal and so on. Fully embracing it and living into it. And through that, moving to a new reality. And that that captures something of the emotion, not of the theological detail, but of the emotion of what's going on here. As we've learned this year, space and emptiness and distance between people and not hugging the people we are most desperate to hug, even at those most incredible life-changing moments of birth and death, is not the denial or absence of love, but the presence of love tangible in that space that we have been leaving between people. It's been very easy as we've, particularly perhaps in early lockdown, as we were seeing images or walking down sheets at streets, and even now, you know, you walk down, you see shops shuttered, um, bins overflowing, a kind of emptiness and absence in the heart of our cities. It's easy to see that as a sign of death. And counterintuitive, but real, to instead see it as a sign of people's love and compassion for one another, a sign of hope and solidarity that we've chosen 
to stay at home, keep that space. And so it seems to me that this, this pandemic year and the fact that we now are gathering, you know, far fewer of us because there are spaces in church that have opened up, but some of us are still gathering here, still maintaining that space and that distance helps us to see more clearly perhaps than ever before this year what it means to say that emptiness and absence lies at the heart of John's version of the Easter story. We would all <laughs> love to know where we are with God. We'd love to have something tangible to hold on to. I mean, remember those howls of outrage um, a year ago when churches were closed over Easter. We want to be able to say that's where God lives. That's where we can find God. That's where we can hold on to God. That's where the answers are. There's that terrible attraction of certainty. But at the heart of the Easter story is this space, God's absence, which is far darker, far more mysterious, far more terrifying, perhaps, than God's presence. Certainly darker and more terrifying and more mysterious than the kind of simple God that we would like to be able to draw our stick figures of and say, yes, that's the answer. God likes everything that I like and condemns everything that I dislike. And that makes life so much easier. But it's in that space that the realisation of God's reality comes, that the realisation of God's presence comes. It's Peter and John don't have a moment like Mary has where they see the risen Jesus. They believe when they encounter that space of Jesus's absence. And it's in that moment that they have a realization of the presence of God. Mary sees Jesus wants to go and hug him and is told not to, told not to cling on to him, but to go and tell others. We are never called to stay in God's presence. We're called to sense it in the absence and then go and tell and keep moving and constantly be off balance, constantly be called into something new. It's frustrating. Because so often we want, we want church to be a place of comfort, a place of familiarity, um, a place where there are truths that we can cling on to when life is constantly changing. And it is, but it is because that place of comfort and presence, that thing that we can cling on to, is an absence, a space, a silence. If it wasn't, it would be kind of stuck there in Galilee, totally irrelevant to our lives now. It would move on as fashions and things moved on. You know, we look around and we think, oh, the world isn't very interested in Christianity anymore. What a shame. And then suddenly lockdown happens, churches are closed, and people who never go near are furious that these empty spaces have been closed. There is a emptiness at the heart of our faith. And we need to make that space because it's when we make that space, when we take time, when we create silence, when we're prepared to let go of the things that we would like to cling to, that we're able to become aware of God's very real presence, which transcends everything and is not limited by particular times or particular places. And it's really difficult. That was as long as I could hold a silence without it being really uncomfortable to be doing that on Facebook.
Make space in your life for God. Sit with the discomfort of silence and absence. And if today of all days, it's something that you're really struggling with, that you're not hugging people, not seeing people, not in church. Sit with that as your experience of the empty tomb, which is where that resurrection experience happens. Amen. Lord, you are our strength and our song. The earth and its people cry out for a new life of wholeness and healing. May we work always towards the goal of peace with justice, knowing that with your help we can do mighty things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are our strength and our song. We remember the places where we live and work that sustain and refresh us. As restrictions are eased, may we enter them anew with thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are our strength and our song. In our parish of St Luke in the city and in other parishes across the country, there is a gentle return to in-person services. We give thanks for all who lead your people and for your love that has enabled us to endure in these difficult times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are our strength and our song. We offer now, either in the silence of our hearts or in the comments, our own concerns for ourselves and those we know and love. ever I just want to give thanks for this the technology that makes this possible this allows us to be together whilst apart May we remember that your love endures forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are our strength and our song. On this Easter day, we rejoice in the resurrection of Christ. May we find the signs of resurrection in our own lives, today and always. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come to the peace. Christ descended to death and hell, passed through doors locked by fear to breathe the spirit of peace and make us one humanity. Nothing can now separate us from the love of God. The peace of God be always with you. I'm going to move to our Eucharistic prayer now, which is taken from um, a combination of some of Stephen Shakespeare's words and some Iona words. God is here, the Spirit is with us. We open our hands in thanks and our song is one of welcome. We praise you, God of freedom, for you breathed life into the void 
and showed yourself as the one who loves in freedom. From the nothingness of slavery, you called a people into being and led them to the springs of life. In Jesus, you confronted the powers that killed and oppressed. You spoke to those considered dead and helped them to stand again. Jesus gave himself for us, tortured and forsaken, but he could not be confined by death. In the garden, he speaks our name. In the breaking of the bread, he shows himself among us. By the lakeside, in the new day, he calls us to take up his work. Therefore, with all who lost faith, all who walked away in sadness, we confess ourselves surprised by the suddenness of dawn. In Christ, you sit as the guest at the table of the stranger. In Christ, you stand among us as host and guest at the heart of this community. As hosts with Christ, we bless this bread. As guests with Christ, we pour this wine. As welcomed strangers united in Christ's life, death and embodied liberation, we hear the words of promise. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. This cup poured out is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink to remember me. In this action of justice making, we recall broken minds and bodies, blood shed through the lust for power. And we pray, restore and heal all that is wounded. Be present in the stillness of the waiting. Roll back the stone of prejudice and fear. Release the signs of spring. We gently break this bread of fragile life. Our breaking down becomes our breaking through. And so together with all disciples in the Diocese of Liverpool and across the world, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. You can use whichever version of the Lord's Prayer you know best. I'm just going to share the version from the New Zealand Prayer Book. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver. Source of all that is and that shall be. Father and mother of us all. Loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom Sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is your God coming to you in bread and wine. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I'm going to distribute these um, around my family who are watching on another screen in another room. Um, and if you have something to eat or drink at home, then please do share it now so that we're eating and drinking together as a sign of our community, even across 
this space. So a blessing, and then um, I have a final hymn to share with you. Despite everything, the heart of God is still beating. It beats the names of all we have loved and lost. It beats with grief. It beats with hope. It beats with possibility. Feel the sacred pulse within your chest a holy rhythm that binds us across the ages to the beating hearts of those who have gone before us and those who are yet to come, inviting us to stay attuned to all that still lives even in and beyond death. Christ is risen and love presses on. May we press on for one another, for beauty, for justice, for life and the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and giver of life, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Now let me share my screen again. And we'll join together in our final...
So depart in peace. The work of the world lies before us. Accomplish justice with grace. In the name of Christ. Amen. So Rose and Eve might want to unmute themselves to say goodbye. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, I'm hoping somebody might. Yeah, there we are. Kath has just posted the link for After Church Coffee in the comments. So you might want to copy that uh, if it's not something you have to hand. It's the same one as has been in the um, in the e-news. So um, when I've closed this meeting down, I will go on to Zoom and open up the After Church Coffee. If you'd like to grab a drink and come and say hello. Happy Easter. It'll probably just be fairly brief this morning. Um, don't want to keep you from your Easter eggs if you've got them. Uh, but see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.